Amen. How many are excited to be in church today, you guys? Make some noise. Come on. Welcome everyone, join us online or outside, wherever you're at. We're excited that you are here as well. We're in part two of a series called Battles and Breakthrough. And if you by chance missed last Sunday's message, I just believe it was um, one of those messages I felt like, like is like once in a, I don't know, year kind of message that the Holy Spirit just birthed and released something here. If you have not watched that and you're just catching on to part two today, I want to encourage you to go check that out because we set the stage for this journey that we believe is going to be extremely powerful for you. Every week, we are going to bring you a specific battle and how to get breakthrough. Today, today we're going to start to look at, begin to look at the different battlefields of spiritual warfare. And today, battlefield number one is the demonic realm, the demonic realm. Now, I don't know if you're like, some of you are like, I'm excited. Some of you are like, finally, let's go. Let's talk about these demons, pastor. And some of you are like, oh no, where I came to church on the wrong day today. And so I'm hopefully going to make it relatable, applicable to every person. But here's what I don't want to do. I really, I don't want to overly emphasize the enemy, but I also don't want to you know, cause you to not be aware of his schemes, of the reality that there is a spiritual battle against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly realms. Like this is real. And I honestly believe that you cannot fight spiritual warfare effectively if you are not aware that you have an enemy called the devil and demonic forces of evil. And so in fact, like what I'm gonna share with you today, many pastors don't teach this. I would venture to say 95% of you are not going to have ever heard what I'm going to share with you today. Because today, I'm going to blow up the, the battle plan of the enemy. I, I, I read the book. I know his structure, his strategy, his military hierarchy. And I'm actually going to share that with you today. And like that's something a lot of you haven't heard. And a lot of pastors don't teach us. And here's why because we don't want you to get all like overly emphasized on the demonic things and not focus on the other battlefields. It's just one of the battlefields, a very important one, but there are two other battlefields that we actually need to fight. And here's why I think a lot of us pastors don't teach on this specifically a lot, is because we as humans have the tendency to want to shift blame a lot. And it would just be a lot easier if the devil made me do it. I mean, you know what I'm talking about. If it, it was a devil, man. I'm telling you that devil, if it was, ooh, that, and, and we don't take any responsibility and no ownership. So today, today, I'm going to overly emphasize the demonic realm. I am, I am, because I, I want you to see something. But I need you to promise me something, that you won't continue to overly emphasize it, number one. And number two, you'll come back for the next two weeks to, to learn how to fight on the other two battlefields. Can I get an amen, you guys? All right, all right. But today, I am. I'm going to take the liberty, and I'm going to overemphasize some things. And I want to share with you today the six levels of demonic hierarchy. All right, I'm gonna show you the hierarchy because the enemy is like very structured and organized. He's not chaotic. He's not all over the place. He's got a battle plan and a military structure that I'm gonna show you. It'll be more Bible study. We're gonna dig into that a little bit. And then I'm gonna get really practical and I'm gonna share with you seven ways that we can guard our lives. You can guard your family, your marriage. You can guard your calling against the influence of demonic spirits and overcome them in Jesus' name. Amen, you guys? Okay, let me, let's, let me lay some groundwork though for us before we just jump into this. I need us to receive it from the right posture, from the right place in our identity in Christ. Here's what we need to know. Write it down somewhere. Christians cannot be possessed, but they can be oppressed by the enemy. I got, look, and this is, this is like maybe one of those issues that, that some of my friends even divide on. Some people believe, no, you can't. I, I've taught on this before on why I believe it is very unbiblical to think and believe that believers can be possessed. Um, and, and to which some people are like, but that's not my experience. No, but your experience needs to submit to the word of God. Because even your experience is a manifestation of deception then. Are y'all hearing me? When, when someone goes, oh no, but I've, I've experienced something. I've seen it where someone who was like, like a Christian was possessed. No, no, what you saw was a deception of the enemy manifest, not an actual demon manifest. 
Okay, so, so in, in receiving this and understand this, it's going to disarm the enemy from your life because if you believe you can't be possessed, you will continue to have those problems manifest in your life. I promise you. It is a deception of the enemy. Believers cannot be possessed, but they can be oppressed. Now, what's the difference? You can be attacked, harassed, afflicted, tormented, emotionally, physically, spiritually, but he cannot take over your faculty. He cannot, he cannot take over your will, your mind, your body, but he can jack you up. I mean, you know what I'm talking about, okay? He can mess you up. We need to receive this from the right, we're in the right posture though. Here's what 1 John chapter 4, verse 4 says. He says, you dear children are from God and you've overcome all these forces because the one who is in you is greater than the one who's in the world. Somebody shout amen for that. The title of today's message is Closing the Doors to demonic influence. That's what we're going to do today. We're going to close the doors in our life to demonic influence. And I pray, even as I teach this, that, that you would get revelation through the Holy Spirit of what open doors that you have caused in your life. What are, what are the access points that maybe these, these spiritual forces of evil have been oppressing in different ways in you, your marriage, your children, your calling, and we're going to close the doors to demonic influence. How many of you, like in your house, maybe it's just my house, but if you leave the door open, those mosquitoes just like, they just come right in. Do you know what I mean? Flies just come right in. And, and I don't know why, but mosquitoes love the taste of my wife's blood. Just love it. Everyone, like, we're all good. And she's all pop, 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 pop. Like somebody left the door open and she's all bit up and stuff, okay? Here's what happened. The door has been open to them. Listen, and access has been granted to those mosquitoes. See, Ephesians chapter four, verse 27 says, give no opportunity to the devil. Demons act similar to those mosquitoes, <laughs> similar to those flies in your life. They come right into a life when a door has been opened. Demons dwell where access has been given. Demons dwell where access has been given. And there are three main categories that cause open doors. Let's, let's just stay We'll go really large and we'll dig in deep, all right? Go real large and dig in deep. Three main doors. Number one is demonic doors that are open through inheritance. What, what, what do we mean by that? I mean through your family, through your bloodline. You can actually inherit demonic influence in your life. We call this generational sin. Sins that have followed your ancestors and it's messing with you, knocking at your door, or generational trauma, the same experiences and traumatic experience and abuses and, and physical and sexual and emotional or spiritual abuses are passed down from generation to generation, even generational habits and addictions. We simply just call these generational curses. Someone said, it may have ran into your family or it may have ran in your family, but it ran out when it ran into you. Come on, somebody. That's a, this is where it ran out. It ran out when it ran into me. In Jesus' name, we're going to close some doors. In fact, in, in my book, The Spiritual Battlefield, I, I detail 14 generational curses, 14 of the most common that I've seen, generational curses, and then even break down some prayers for breakthrough on how to get some breakthrough in that. That's number one. That's a, that's a door. The second door is intrusion. Write that down, intrusion. That's where demons literally, they intrude, they'll invade our life. And it's usually at a, at, a, at a point of opportunity where we are susceptible because of hurt, trauma, abuse, someone violated you. And it's, it's opportunities where we are susceptible and weakened, where these, these spiritual forces of evil can come in or try to come in and wreak havoc. Or even like, you know, it could be the result of a broken home. There may be consequences for vulnerable little children who have grown up in volatile, broken home situations where anger, resentment, hatred, these things open the door for the enemy to access these children's lives, okay? That's intrusion. And then the third way that we can open the door is through involvement, involvement. We're gonna talk about all these to one degree or another. Maybe you've been involved in some things that has opened the door, Sin or some other, like, just open the door to enemy. The, the, they can't, the mosquitoes came in because you opened the door. And we're going to actually talk about what those doors are that we can open up today. We're going to go deeper in our understanding of spiritual warfare today. And it's very essential to understand that the enemy's forces, it's not a haphazard, chaotic thing. It's a very organized, military, strategic advance to steal, kill, 
and destroy your life. See, you can't effectively fight what you don't understand. I really believe that. You got to have some understanding of the spirit realm. And it's there in the word of God. And I want to show it to you. I'm going to primarily look at, there's really two primary sources where the curtain is kind of pulled back for us and we're able to see the spiritual realm and the demonic forces of evil and what maybe strategy they even have. Daniel chapter 10 and Ephesians chapter six is where we're gonna primarily be today. We'll have some other supporting scriptures, but those are the two ones we're, gonna, we're going to dig into because when you understand the enemy's hierarchy, listen, you can disarm his strategy. And the enemy may have a strategy, but God has already won the war. Amen, you guys? He's already won the war, and we need to receive this in the right way. But let me give you the six, demonic, the six levels of demonic hierarchy according to Scripture. Y'all ready for this? Y'all ready? Okay, last, last week I actually talked to you about one of these levels, and I didn't call it the level that it was. You know, Baal, Asherah, Molech, these these gods, these spirits, these heavenly beings that, that are influencing culture, governments, and people that are entrenched, that have repossessed culture is what I said last week. It's actually this highest form, the highest level of demonic hierarchy is this. Write it down, thrones or kings. Thrones and kings, that's what they're called in scripture, thrones and kings. So those that I talked about last week would be at this level of a king type of authority orchestrating large scale, scale spiritual warfare uh, over large regions or even nations. When the Bible talks about kings spiritually, it's not just symbolic. They are high ranking demonic authorities seeking to control spiritual, the spiritual atmosphere over large regions. Let me show it to you in Daniel chapter 10, which by the way, in Daniel chapter 10, if you wanna read the context here, some, Daniel is praying and fasting for the help from God. And it took 21 days for an angelic messenger to come and deliver a message to Daniel. And he tells us why it took so long because he was battling demonic forces of evil in the spiritual realm. Look what he says in verse 13. This angel tells Daniel that the prince of the Persian kingdom resisted him 21 days. Now, there wasn't a prince of the Persian kingdom on earth he was talking about. He was referencing a demonic prince, a, a, a throne, a prince in the spiritual realm. And he says this, then Michael, one of the chief princes, so he's an archangel mentioned in scripture, one of God's angels, came to help me. But I was detained there with, look what he says, the king of Persia. Now, he's not talking about the earthly king of Persia. He is talking about a demonic entity that has a rank that he is letting Daniel know there was a demonic king who was reigning over Persia. This was not just a, a delay. It was a spiritual warfare that caused him to not come to Daniel when he wanted to come to Daniel. The, the, these thrones hold dominion in the unseen realm, but they cast really long shadows in the physical world. Let me show you Ezekiel chapter 28. This gives us insight into these thrones by drawing a parallel between the king of Tyre, the fallen cherub. This is widely interpreted as a reference to Satan, by the way. Ezekiel chapter 28 is a reference to Satan himself. And he says this, son of man, take up a lament concerning the king of Tyre and say to him, this is what the sovereign Lord says. And then he goes on to describe how beautiful that this, this demonic being, actually this king of Tyre, Satan. He says, you were the seal of perfection and beauty. He goes on to describe this beauty in great detail. You can read it. But here's what I want you to understand about thrones and kings in the spiritual realm. They're not just powerful, they're deceptive. Okay, they often appear as something very beautiful or wise, but that's just to ensnare and trap those who they seek to control. And the higher the rank, the greater the deception, all right? These thrones disguise their true nature and they, they under the guise of say enlightenment or progress or power, but their end game is the same. It is the destruction and rebellion against God. These, these recognizing the presence of thrones means recognizing the root cause of widespread oppression and taking strategic action in spiritual warfare. Because we don't just pray for individuals. Listen, church, we should be praying for nations. 
all right? We, we don't just intercede on a, uh, for our personal breakthrough, but for the dismantling of strongholds that sit on thrones of deception. And when we target the throne, we disrupt the chain of command of the enemy in the enemy's camp. This is the highest level we see in scripture of the demonic realm, okay? As we move down the hierarchy, we're gonna encounter this next level. Write it down, dominions or princes, Dominions or princes, the Bible says. See, while the thrones and kings, they exert their influence over like really large territories, dominions and princes are really targeting specific re regions, cities, sometimes, you know, even larger than that. But these entities, they're responsible for maintaining the strongholds that thrones are established. Where thrones dictate, princes execute. Daniel chapter 10, verse 20 tells us, he continues, this angel telling us about this behind the scene warfare that's happening. So he said, do you know why I've come to you? Soon the angel said, I will return to fight against, not the king, not the king though, but I'm gonna, I gotta go fight that prince of Persia. And when I go, the prince of Greece will actually come. Now these again, these aren't just metaphors and these aren't titles and hierarchies that are just picked out of nowhere by this angel. These are specific specific entities that have specific authority in the spiritual realm. Princes are the boots on the ground of Satan's hierarchy and strategy. They enforce the will of the higher power demons directly opposing God's work and God's messengers. When you see regions caught like in cycles of corruption or violence or moral decay, you're likely seeing the handiwork of a prince of darkness at work. Okay, as we continue to peel back, let's continue these layers of Satan's hierarchy. Let's, let's, the third one is called principalities. Principalities. See, thrones operate over large regions, specific nations. Principalities focus on the localized areas like cities, communities, even institutions can have a principality of darkness over or inside of them. They're the architects of regional darkness. This comes from Ephesians chapter six, verse 12. Paul tells us that we're not wrestling against flesh and blood enemies, but against what? Principalities. They're the generals in the army of darkness. They're high ranking in, the enemy, in, in this spiritual forces of evil. They create uh, the spiritual atmosphere that fosters sin and oppression. I'm not sure if you've ever walked into an area, maybe even into a city or an institution or a business, and you sense a spirit of heaviness. I don't know if you've ever experienced that. Anyone that has maybe spiritual sensitivity or discernment, and you've gone somewhere, could have been a different city or a side of town, someone's home, uh, and, or, or some business, and you sense something isn't right here. Very often, the reason is because there is a principality at work in that institution or in that region. Amen? Okay, let me show you. I'm just exposing the battle plan of the enemy. Here's the scheme, man. Here's the, and he don't like it, by the way. He tried to keep you away because he didn't want you to hear this, all right? Here's the next layer of Satan's hierarchy, and that is powers, powers. These entities, they operate just below principalities, but their role is, is pretty crucial in the enemy's strategy. They enforce oppression acting as the muscle behind the principality's plans. They're the one who are implementing the directives of higher ranking forces. In Ephesians 6, 12, the apostle Paul includes powers in the list of the spiritual forces that we're wrestling against. They are the foot soldiers of the enemy's kingdom. They're often responsible, listen, for the per persistent struggles that many individuals face Maybe it's a persistent personal sin or a persistent addiction or even societal issues like violence and injustice that's coming from these demonic powers influencing. They are the ones that take the general orders and turn them into specific actions against individuals, families, and even communities. And I need to pause here and just kind of remind us in Colossians 2.15, it says that Jesus has disarmed the powers and authorities, having made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. This means that while powers enforce the enemy's will, they cannot override the authority we have in Christ. Come on, church, say amen. When you stand in the power of his name, all right, you have the ability to break the hold of every power, principality, or ruler in the spiritual forces of darkness. Let me get to this last layer of the hierarchy and that is the, or the second to last really, is the rulers of darkness. 
the rulers of darkness. So powers enforce spiritual oppression on an individual level, okay? But rulers of darkness, they operate in a broader context as we see in scripture. They oversee, listen, entire eras, culture, societal movements are inspired by demonic forces, the rulers of darkness. They are the strategic mind behind widespread cultural deception that we see in our world today. Um, at, at the government level, individual level, but they are the strategic enforcer of rulers and, and darkness. Look what it says in, in verse 12. Again, the apostle Paul lists that we're fighting against these rulers of darkness of this age. They're the ones who are behind establishing these false ideologies and belief systems that are directly opposed to the word of God. They're the ones who craft the lies that actually become accepted as norms in society. They're the ones making sin and rebellion not only appear acceptable, but desirable in our culture. That is from demonic rulers of darkness. These spirits thrive in the shadows of ignorance and spiritual blindness. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 says that the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so they can't see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Whenever you see the widespread confusion, blindness, moral decay, you can be sure that there is a ruler of darkness at work behind the scenes there. Okay, we're gonna reach the final tier. Y'all getting something out of this, all right? Okay, I know this is the Bible study portion. We'll get practical in a moment. I just want you to see that the spiritual realm, according to the scripture, is a lot more structured and organized than you think. And I just think that maybe you and I need to get a lot more structured and organized to fight against it, okay? We need to get a little more strategic in how we're entering spiritual warfare. Here's the last level of hierarchy is the spiritual hosts, is what they're called. Hosts, meaning the, the, of wickedness. They are... Their numbers are vast and wide. They're like locusts everywhere. These are the, the spiritual hosts of wickedness are the ones who are like pervasive agents of chaos at an individual level. And every person and every family is trying to attack and influence the culture of darkness that are set by this demonic hierarchy. It's actually listed again in Ephesians chapter six that we are wrestling against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. So while thrones, princes, and principalities and powers, they dictate and strategize, it's the spiritual hosts of wickedness that actually execute the plans of the enemy on a ground level. These, are the, 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 these spiritual hosts, they thrive on spreading sin, confusion, and moral decay. Their goal is just to create widespread wickedness, to suppress righteousness and the glory of God and the purpose of God on earth. These spiritual hosts, Hosts of wickedness is what they're called. Okay. That was the Bible study portion. I just wanted to expose it. But, but today what we need to understand is the one who's in us is greater than the one that's in the world. And he hasn't left you defenseless. I want to give you seven ways that you can defeat the enemy. There are seven ways that you can guard against demonic influence. Because the battle is real, but God has given us the tools we need. In fact, everything we need to stand firm and be victorious in spiritual warfare. Matthew chapter 16, Jesus said it like this. I tell you, he said to Peter, on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I don't care what hierarchy or strategy, the gates of hell will not prevail against God's church. He says, I'll give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. God has given us the authority and power, the keys of the kingdom of heaven. How do we strategically engage this battlefield, the demonic battlefield, these forces of evil in, in heavenly realms? How do we engage with the authority and power that God has given us? I'm gonna get really practical. Seven ways. We gotta start with this one. Number one, put on the full armor of God. Put on the full armor of God. It has to start here. The first step is simple. Get dressed for battle. You're in a war. Put on the armor. Ephesians 6, 11, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Now, I've taught on this here recently. You can go check those out, specifically what each, what each piece of the armor is and how to put it on. But 
you wouldn't walk into the battlefield in your pajamas. Why would you go into a spiritual battlefield unprotected? The armor of God is not just a metaphor. It is the spiritual defense system against demonic forces. It's not just a metaphor. Each piece of the armor, the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation, the shoes of the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, the sword of the spirit. These aren't metaphors. These are pieces of your spiritual armor to defeat your enemy. Each one serves a purpose. And when you're fully armored, you're fully protected. Half-dressed Christians can't expect full-time victory. You got to put on the full armor of God. That's where we start in guarding and being victorious against these demonic forces of evil that are strategic, that are scheming to steal, kill, and destroy. We got to suit up. We got to suit up, put on the full armor of God. Number two, do not attempt to contact any spirits, church. Don't attempt to contact any spirits. Let's be clear. Don't play with fire unless you want to get burned, all right? Leviticus 19.31 says, Do not turn to mediums or seek out spiritists, for you will be defiled by them, because I am the Lord your God. When you mess around with the occult, you're basically handing over the keys of your life to the enemy. You're opening a door of access, legal granted access for the enemy to walk right into your life and to set up some shop. Holiness and the occult do not mix. You can't serve God and dabble in darkness at the same time. You can't. It's like trying to mix oil and water. It doesn't work. If you want to stay clean, you keep your distance from anything that smells like the enemy. And in today's world, it's like the temptation to contact spirits is more prevalent than other. Because it's very disguised as like, as fun, as curiosity, as entertainment even. But the Bible is really clear. When you seek to contact spirits, you're, you are opening up a demonic doorway. Okay, what are some of those doorways that we are opening up through maybe trying to contact spirits? Let me get really practical with you guys. Ouija boards and games like them. Okay. Mediums, when you go to any psychics or mediums, you're opening up a demonic door of attack in your life and your family. If you're, if you're trying to engage with spirit guides or channeling or crystals that are used for spiritualism, witchcraft, sorcery, tarot cards, and divination, all these things open up demonic doorways of attack and influence into your life. You know, some of these people, they, they deceive people, others, um, to believe that they're actually contacting like dead people. And, let me just say, and that, might not be, that might be unfamiliar for a, a lot of you today, but culturally, I, I've talked to many people that this is a cultural thing that they try to talk to and contact dead people, ancestors, and what they don't realize is you are not, listen, you are not talking to your husband, your grandpa, a family member. You are talking to a demon. That is not a family member. That's what's called a familiar spirit. You ever heard that term, familiar spirit? A familiar spirit are spirits that attach themselves to individuals, families, even for generations, and they can mimic the voice, the personality, even the look of your loved one or one of your ancestors because they are familiar with them. And they will, the whole goal is not to, is to create an emotional connection to bring you into bondage, Okay. This is do not, con this is just a guard, guard your life from demonic influences. You, you just do not try to contact spirits. Number three, test every spiritual message you receive. Test every spiritual, every sermon I preach, you should be testing it with the word of God. You should be testing every podcast you listen to or YouTube you listen to. Test every spiritual message, a rule to live by. Don't believe everything you read. Don't believe everything you hear, especially in the spiritual realm. As it relates to the spirit, do not believe everything coming from the spirit realm. 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. Dear friends, don't believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God because there's a lot of people with a platform or a microphone that are not from God, that are false that are spreading a demonic spirit, sometimes even unknowingly. Be careful. 
These false prophets have gone out into the world just because it's spiritual doesn't mean it's holy. It's, it may be spiritual, sure it's spiritual, sounds spiritual, but what spirit is it? Spiritual discernment. You need spiritual discernment. It's like a filter, it keeps out all the junk, man. If a message doesn't line up with the word of God, you toss it out. I mean, you wouldn't drink spoiled milk. Why would you consume spoiled doctrine? Okay? So, so here, that which leads to this, this fourth way that we're guarding against these demonic influences. Number four, you gotta stay rooted in scripture, church. Stay rooted in the word of God. You want to keep the enemy at bay? Stay grounded in the word. Psalm 119, 105 says, your word is a lamp for my feet and a light on my path. See, the Bible isn't just a book. It's a battle plan. This is the strategy. This is the, bio, this is the, the battle plan. And, and the, the, the word of God is a weapon, not a wallflower. Some of y'all got it on your bookshelf or like on the, on the shelf and it's like, it looks pretty up there. It's your decorative thing to let, let everyone know in your living room, you're a Christian. It's designed to be used, not just admired. When it comes to guarding ourselves against deception, the most powerful spiritual tool you have is the word of God. Staying rooted in scripture. You know what it's like? It's like financial experts, what they do to to spot counterfeit money, right? What, what they do is they become intimately familiar with the real thing so that fake bills will be noticed immediately when it passes through their hands. That's what they do. The same principle applies to your spiritual discernment. The more you know God's word, the easier it is to detect lies. See, you don't defeat deception by studying lies. You defeat it by knowing the truth. So the goal isn't, Hey, let me just, let me, let me study all the demonic and all the names and all the, all the. See, this is why pastors don't teach this stuff because some of you go crazy on it. Some of you want to dive deep into it and thinking that's going to actually guard your life. That's not going to, studying deception does not guard your life. It's knowing the truth that guards your life. It's knowing the truth of the word of God. When you immerse yourself in scripture, you're training your spiritual senses to recognize the genuine, just as that trained eye of financial experts is able to spot that fake bill because they are intimately aware with the real deal is the man and woman of God who is intimately aware of their word when the enemy tries to deceive them and lie to them. Amen. The truth of God's word is our standard. Everything else is measured against the truth of God's word. The word of God is not just information, it's transformation. It shapes our thoughts. It shapes our beliefs. It aligns our spirit to the truth. When you know the truth, you're not easily swayed by the counterfeit of the enemy. The more familiar you are with truth, the less attractive the lies will be. So what do we got to do, you guys? We, we, if we're going to guard against these spiritual forces of evil, we got to put on the armor of God. You, 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 you don't attempt to contact spirits. Test every spiritual message you receive. Stay rooted in Scripture. And number five, remove every questionable item from your house. Here's a really simple tip. If it raises an eyebrow, it probably needs to go. Okay, Deuteronomy 7, 26. Do not bring a detestable thing into your house. Mom, dad, parent, husband, wife. Do not bring any detestable thing into your house or you like it will be set apart for destruction. Regard it as vile and utterly detest that thing, for it is set apart for destruction. If there's something in your home, listen, that ties to the occult or immorality or anything that doesn't honor God, get rid of it. Your home should be a sanctuary, not a storage unit for the enemy. Acts 19 and 19 shows us this was actually the pattern of the early church when they came to Christ the stuff that wasn't all, that, that was of the occult, they, they got rid of it. Look what it says. A number who had practiced sorcery through their scrolls together and uh, scrolls together and burned them publicly. When they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came out to 50,000 drachmas. Don't let your home be a hideout for spiritual junk. Let me give you some examples of what are those questionable items that may be in your home. Any occult items that you might have in your home. Anything associated with the occult, like the Ouija boards, tarot cards, crystals used for divination, any books about witchcraft, sorcery, those things need to go. 
They're not just harmless funds. They're, they're, they're doorways to demonic influence into your life. Holding on to those things can invite the enemy into your home. How about this? How about media and entertainment? Some movies, some music, maybe some video games or some, some books that, that glorify things that shouldn't be glorifying. What you allow into your home through media shapes the spiritual atmosphere of your home. How about any relics from false religions that you have in your home? Any objects of other religions, any statues you have that were cute? You thought it was cute. Oh, no, it just means this. No, no, no. That is a demonic spirit. Okay, any, any of those relics from or, or false religions, these items carry spiritual significance. They can bring a spirit of confusion and oppression into your home. Or artifacts with unclear origins. Just, you know, you got to be cautious about some antiques, some artifacts, some souvenirs. You don't know their history. Some objects may have been used for rituals and ceremonies to worship a demon. So you got to be careful with those things. Or really easy, just pornographic material. Pornographic material, this includes anything, anything that promotes sexual immorality, sex outside of marriage in your home. This is like pornography is a major gateway to the enemy to invade your thoughts, to invade your relationships, to invade your home. When you clean out these items, I'm telling you, it'll be like cleaning out the cobwebs in your house. When you get rid of it, all that stuff that doesn't belong, you're making room from the presence of God to fill your space. Don't let the enemy set up camp in your life through things that you own. And, I, and when you remove them, when you remove some of these, today, it, today, you need to go through your house, remove some stuff. Then you need to pray over your house and ask the Holy Spirit to come in and bless that place. Because a clean house is a guarded house. And a guarded house is a blessed house. How many want a blessed house in this place? Amen. All right. We just need to be aware. I'm just trying to make you aware of the battlefield. It's real. This is real. Number six, do not give anger a foothold. Do not give anger a foothold. Let's face it, you guys. Anger is a doorway and the devil is waiting on the other side. Let me show it to you. Ephesians chapter four, verse 26 and 27. If you are angry, the Bible is like going to give you that. Like, okay, you're going to get angry. It's not a sin just to be angry. But if you're angry, don't sin by holding on to that grudge, by nursing it. Like you're feeding it. You're like, you're just feeding that thing. You're nursing it. You ain't, you're not healing from it. You're not dealing with it. And what's happening is any unresolved anger, wound, or hurt is opening a door to a demonic spirit. I'm telling you, it's a possible open door in your life. I actually just taught on this in our morning devotions. Pastor Veronica and I, in one of our live devotions just this last week, you can go watch on it. I spoke specifically about the open door of hate, the open door of anger when it's unresolved in our life. He says, don't let the sun go down when you're still angry. Like, he's saying, deal with it quickly. He says, get over it. Come on, that's a prophetic word for someone today. Get over it quickly. Because when you're angry, you're giving a mighty foothold to the devil. Holding on to that anger is, is leaving your front door wide open. I'm just trying to help you understand, like, how do you guard your life? Because some of us have unknowingly opened the door. And this is one of those unknowing open doors that we have. When you nurse that grudge, you give a devil a guest room. Which leads to this last one I want to close with. Number seven, forgive offenses quickly, church. Forgive offenses quickly. And I'll even add daily. Write that on there. Forgive offenses quickly and daily. Because you may have forgiven them you know, last month, but it came back in your mind and you let it sit there again. You started nursing it again. So you got to forgive them quickly and forgive it every time the enemy tries to lie to you again and bring it up. Every time he tries to bring it up. Forgive. Don't let bitterness build a nest in your heart. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, the apostle Paul was writing to the church at Corinth again. He was trying to give them some advice on forgiveness and not holding on to grudges. And he was trying to give this entire church advice on how to protect it. And I want you to receive this church. Anyone who calls Discovery Home, will you receive this as, as a word to you? Look what it says. The focus of my letter, Paul says, wasn't on punishing the offender who did something wrong to us, but on getting you to take responsibility for the health of the church. There's really, 
So stop, stop pointing fingers at the people that did something wrong and take some responsibility for the health of the body of Christ. Stop nursing and being angry and offended and going, man, and take some responsibility, church, for the health of your family, for the health of the body of Christ, the health of the church. So he says, if you forgive them, I'm gonna forgive them. Don't think I'm carrying around a list of personal grudges. That's not, we're not gonna do that. The fact is, I'm joining with you in your forgiveness as Christ is with us, guiding us. After all, we don't want to unwittingly, look what he says, give Satan an open door for yet more mischief in our fellowship, in our lives. We're not oblivious to his ways. The Apostle Paul is showing us an open door, not only to your individual life, but an open door to the body of Christ, the church. When we hold on to offenses, the grudge, when we don't forgive, specifically brothers and sisters in Christ in the fellowship, you're not only opening a door in your life, you're opening a door to the body of Christ. And, it's, and some of us need to take responsibility, not just for reconciling and resolving that issue and not letting it nurse, but some of us need to take some responsibility for what you're bringing into your small group. <laughs> for the crap you talk behind the scenes to your brother your sister in Christ. You spread in some stuff that you shouldn't spread. And you're a tool of the enemy. I'm sorry for saying that word, but I just felt like the Lord need to say something to somebody right now. Okay, you need to, you, you need to, and the reason why isn't that, oh man, no, no, I understand there's issues. Everyone, well, well we all are gonna have issues. But that's not what, that's not really the problem. The problem is the deception you're believing by spreading it. That's the problem. You're, you become a tool of the enemy. So forgive how do we guard our life from demonic influences, these strategies and schemes, this organized scheme of the enemy? We need to get more organized ourselves. We need to get more systematic ourselves in the way that we fight, in the way that we battle the spiritual force of you. We need, to, we need to learn how to let it go and forgive. We need to close some doors. Some of us didn't even know there were doors that we opened. And even as I was speaking today, you, 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 the Lord was revealing to you, oh man, whether it was in like a generational thing, or there was some intrusion because a wound or hurt, some, some grudge you held on, you didn't deal with it, you didn't resolve it, you didn't bring it before the throne of Jesus to receive grace and mercy and your help in time of need, and the enemy saw that as an opportunity to come in and to, to lie to you. There was an intrusion that happened, or even some of you, the involvement that you've gotten yourself into. You've, you've literally opened the door to sin or some practices in your life that have invited demonic influence. And today, what I'd like to do as we begin to close is to start to close that door. I really, I'm really enjoying these 30 days of freedom because I don't just get to talk on Sunday about this topic. I get to treat this as a whole month long journey because I'll, I'll begin the conversation here, but then in our devotions, I'll, in the morning at 7 a.m., we're going to continue it. On Friday night, we're going to actually continue to demolish some demonic strongholds. But today, what I'd like to do is begin to close the doors that God has revealed to you today. And he revealed it to you on purpose so you can respond and close the door in Jesus' name. Hey, thank you for watching the Discovery Church YouTube channel. Don't stop here. Join the Discovery Online family every Sunday. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream event and share it with a friend. You can also support the ministry by clicking the Give button to help us continue to reach people around the world for Jesus Christ. Thank you again for watching. Go love God, love each other, and change the world.